Welcome to What That Means with Camille, where we take the confusion out of tech jargon and encourage more meaningful conversation about cybersecurity. Here is your host, Camille Moorhart. Hi, and welcome to Cybersecurity Inside. Today, we're going to do an episode on cybernetics, what that means, with Genevieve Bell. She's a distinguished professor at Australian National University and is also director of the School of Cybernetics and 3A Institute there, which she founded. She's also the Florence Violet McKenzie Chair at ANU for promoting inclusive use of technology and society. Stick with me, we're not done. She's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering, the first distinguished fellow at the SRI Institute, which was founded by the trustees of Stanford University, She's also vice president and a senior fellow in the Advanced Research and Development Labs at Intel. And if that is not enough for you, she is also officer of the Order of Australia, which is for distinguished service of a high degree to Australia or to humanity at large. That's hilarious. Welcome, Genevieve. It is hilarious. And you have to know it comes somewhere. It comes with a pin that I'm required to wear on all occasions that sits somewhere on my collar and basically signals that. I am a good human being and can be called upon to do things in the service of humanity. Are you wearing the pin now? A little tiny gold one right there. So you have accolades at the highest level across industry, across academia, across government in at least two hemispheres. And I think that most people be very impressed by that. And others might think suspicious. Yes. And I sometimes sit somewhere between those two things. I grew up here in Australia. Today I'm on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people in Canberra. And like all of these moments, I should acknowledge where I am and pay my respects to the elders of this place and acknowledge that I'm sitting on land that's always sacred and was never ceded. And I was raised in a culture that isn't very good on people who excel. So we talk about tall poppy syndrome here in Australia. So don't put your head above the parapet or chop you off. So very different than the kind of American wanting to constantly kind of strive. The narrative of pulling yourselves up by your bootstraps and being amazing is kind of a, a counter narrative to the one I grew up with. So I find myself uncomfortable with my own biography sometimes. So when people read off all those accolades, it makes me twitchy and slightly nervous. And I think that's partly because there's something very strange about having all those other people have assessed you to be something and what you kind of do with that. And I also fully recognize that in some parts of the world, some of those uh, marks of esteem ought to be deeply suspicious. It's like, really? <laughs> what did you do to get that? And what does that mean? And who really thinks you're that? And oh my God, what should we do with any of those things? Uh, yeah, no, mostly when people do what you just did, which is read out my biography, I sit there and twitch uncontrollably. And you're obviously influential. So I'm kind of interested in you know, what pulls your internal compass, what inspires you, what impact do you want to have on the planet? You know, what's in your heart? Yeah, gosh, those are such good questions. So I had an unusual childhood. I grew up part of my time in Melbourne and Canberra here in Australia, and then part of my time living in Central and Northern Australia. My mother was an anthropologist and I grew up on her field sites. And I grew up living in Indigenous communities. I grew up exposed to the extraordinary challenges that come with being an Indigenous person in Australia and with what it means to navigate the tensions between traditional owners, colonial forces and power. I don't want to keep reproducing the world that I grew up in and the world that even I find myself in today. And so for me, the decisions I make, the places I choose to work, the work I do, always sitting inside of it is a core of if this work is done well, things will be different as a result of it. And the difference may not happen on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it may take a little while to get there, but that's usually what's driving it. I want to also just stick with the standard format I have too, which is we're going to talk about cybernetics. And can you spend a couple of minutes just defining what that is to bring people up to speed? I don't think that's a term that many people are super familiar with today, even though it actually has kind of a long history. You're right. Cybernetics is a term that's been around for at least, well, depending on where you look at it, at least 80 years, maybe a lot longer. It's an, a term with a complicated biography, though, so it's worth unfolding it just a little bit, right? So the reason it may sound familiar to the consumers of 
this podcast is that it is a term that's been kept alive in science fiction. So you will have encountered cybernetics in the Terminator movies. You might have encountered it in The Matrix. You might have encountered it even in Ready Player One and other things more recently. So cybernetics turns up as a term there. If you're from the other big science fiction canon, the British one, you'll know it from Douglas Adams and the serious cybernetics company, which made, you know, Marvin the Paranoid Android and Prescient Lists. <laughs> and the reason it got to science fiction, however, is it started in science fact. So in the United States, cybernetics history starts in World War II, where it is a term brought into currency by a man named Norbert Wiener, who was a mathematician and uh, later became an AI and robotics expert at MIT. He coined the term in a book he published in 1948, and he means it to mean a science or a grammar or a language, he calls it, a language and a set of techniques that would enable us to manage the problem of control and communication in machines and humans is basically his argument. And you're like, well, what the hell does that mean? Well, you've got to then understand a little bit of the history of technology. So back during World War II, we saw computers, as we would understand them, really start to come into common currency. The first of the computers that are the ancestors of the things we are communicating on come into existence during World War II. So the ENIAC, as well as a few others. And the presence of those computational objects changed the way people thought about data, that changed the way people thought about communications, and it changed the way what people thought was possible from technology. And coming out of World War II, it was really clear the computers weren't just going to be big machines that crunch numbers to aim guns, but they were going to be objects that could sit inside of decision-making frameworks and industry and scientific discovery and potentially even inside people's homes to do sorts of things that were a bit vague. <laughs> and so for a collection of big thinkers and who ran the gamut from mathematicians and chemists and physicists through to philosophers, historians, psychologists, anthropologists, and then public policy people. For that group of people, they were sitting there in the aftermath of World War II saying, okay, well, that was a pretty cataclysmic thing. And we created an enormous amount of damage and destruction. Right. They'd seen the destructive power of technology. They had, and they were determined that what came next shouldn't look like that. And that, you know, they had seen in some ways the worst that human beings could do to each other in the war and were determined that what came next needed to be more deliberate and needed to have that notion in Norbert's words of steerage and navigation that we should manage the machines, not let the machines manage us. And so for Norbert and his colleagues, the idea of cybernetics was the idea of trying to create the possibility that we could build a framework for how we would manage technology. And for he and his colleagues, that framework had a couple of really important features. One was that you needed to understand computers as part of a system, that there was a system that happened here, right? And that the computation didn't exist by itself. It sat inside a system that had technologies, the environment, and humans. And that we needed to look at it holistically that way, that as you talked about computation, you couldn't divorce it from talking about humans and the ecosystems in which they found themselves, which is already... In 1946, 1947, that feels like a pretty radical proposition because it still feels like a radical proposition in 2022. <laughs> we should talk about technology, but we should probably talk about humans and the ecology as well. The second piece they said was that you needed to understand circular causality or the idea that any piece in the system had a reciprocal relationship with other pieces in the system so that you couldn't just focus on one thing without thinking about what the consequences were for the others and about what the relationship was, not just the components. So put another way, what cybernetics also was, was the beginning of systems engineering. Right. While cybernetics was the theory in some ways, systems engineering was its applied version. And so for people like Claude Shannon, and then we ought to recognize, kind of the grandfather of information theory, Claude Shannon at Bell Labs took cybernetics and turned it into systems engineering, mm -hmm. as did many other people involved in those conversations. So one incredibly long, too long, don't read answer, <laughs> what is cybernetics, is it's a theory of machinery and computational machinery at that that was created in the 1940s and the 1950s. A second answer to that, however, is a much older one, because cybernetics was also a conversation that was happening in France in the 1800s and even with the ancient Greeks way back when. So it's an idea that's been around for a long time. For me, the important pieces of it are about it's a systems level approach. It lets you think about systems. It's a systems level approach that argues pretty persuasively that you can't think about technology without thinking about humans and 
the environment, which for me feels really kind of useful. And then I think there's a whole lot of stuff about how cybernetics unfolded in the 40s and 50s that are useful for thinking about how you would build organizations now. You know, there's lots of questions that coming off that, but I have a couple, which is one thing you're, when you're talking about, well, you know, people are figuring out how technology is going to affect humans, for example. Now, you know, we're hearing about technology literally going inside of humans, this concept of human brain interface and other kinds of mechanisms by which we can enhance, we we'll, we'll use the word enhance a human experience by having technology, you know, literally become a part of a person. So they're inseparable at that point. So how does this notion of control of the machine or, or controlling, you know, its intent or whatnot, and also its ability to potentially down the line control you, if it's inside of you, can you kind of comment on that, that relationship? I can. And I think one of the challenges here has to do with how we understand control in the 21st century and how it was understood in the 20th. So we think of control and we have a, you just use the language, right? Control as in, I want to basically be in, in charge of it, as opposed to control simply meaning, how do we understand how things flow? And I think for Norbert and his colleagues, the notion of control and steerage and navigation are an important cluster of words. So it wasn't about absolute being in charge of everything. It was about how do you ensure some ability to see how the thing is unfolding and have points of intervention in that unfolding and to be able to theorize what happens if you do this and what the flow on effects are. The ideas that you're unfolding are a really different set of questions, right, which is about where are the limits of human autonomy? What does it mean to be an autonomous human? Where do we get to say no to things? Because really being in control in some ways is about do you have an ability to decline something, not an ability to accept something? Although I think being able to say yes to things is equally in some ways interesting. So the notions about are there places where technical systems will impinge on our bodies and how do we think about that? is a question, of course, that extends far beyond putting technologies in our bodies because we've been putting technologies in our bodies for a really long time. That is, of course, what vaccines are. And look at the arguments we're having about those. There's no surprise in some ways that those arguments are being surfaced right now too. You know, we have put the latest technologies in our bodies if we go back to the early smallpox vaccines or to the polio vaccines of the last century or to notions about pacemakers or IVF technology, all of which were us putting technologies in our bodies. And if you think of every single one of those, they have been highly and hotly contested, as have ideas about, you know, more banal and benign things, cataract surgery, organ replacement. <laughs> you know, there's lots of places where our bodies have served as sites of serious technological intervention. Mm -hmm. And then there have been places where it's happened without consent. Think about the Tuskegee Airmen, think about various kinds of forced sterilization in different communities, think about the ways in which certain bodies have had work done to them without their consent. And you start to realize that the notion about the most recent nanotechnologies or various forms of computational technologies in our bodies are actually part of a much longer legacy where those questions are already highly charged and in some ways quite hard to unpick and unpack all the pieces though you're usually safe in asserting in those places that there are certain bodies that tend to be less able to say no than others and certain bodies upon which those experiments tend to be enacted in ways that are less thoughtful and so for me as we think about how might we want to respond to the latest generations of technologies being put in and on our bodies is to not imagine it's the first time we've had those conversations, but to sort of start to want to look at some of those other histories and then ask the questions about how is consent constituted? Who gets to say yes or no? Who is in some ways benefiting from the consequences? And these are questions that are also regulatory. These are questions that sit at law, not just in kind of philosophical debate. Well, you also look at, and whether we want to look at this from inside the body or information being collected outside the body with or without permission, mm -hmm. when you look at, let's say, even just as we migrate toward, say, a smart city or autonomous driving and information is being collected, we'll even say the intent, we can, we can posit the intent is solely good. Let's make traffic more efficient. But 
there is still this ability to collect information on, you know, who is in the car and where they are going based on their map system. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, not to mention in deciding that a smart city's traffic system would orient to efficient flows of cars is already making a set of decisions about who's whose experiences of a city are privileged versus others, right? Because we know for most drivers, in order to have a satisfactory experience of driving, you want pedestrian crossings minimised. You want the time that a pedestrian crossing lasts for minimised. And in doing that, you're usually making it harder for people who are not physically abled, for people who have mobility problems, for people who are lugging suitcases or prams. <laughs> so suddenly you realise that in making it efficient for cars, in that instance, you may be making it inefficient for humans, and certain kinds of humans will suffer more than others. And you're exactly right. What information is being collected? Who has access to it? What sense is being made of it? And how is that sense making then being used for further determinations? And so there's something... In all of that, for me, where you have to start asking, in some ways, a really hard and often banal set of questions, but really important ones, which are about power, uh, time, regulation policies and standards. Beneficiary. <laughs> exactly. And about intent. And then realizing that deciding you're going to do something now, because mm -hmm. your intent in 2022 is about this doesn't mean that what you did then won't have both unintended consequences and flow-on consequences that may be manifested 10, 20 years from now that are much harder to be thinking about. So a couple other things that that's making me wonder, I know you've talked about a couple of uses of AI being surveillance and desire. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little, it seems like we might be touching on the edge of that right now. Oh, absolutely. So it's really important to think about the ways in which data is collected by human for what. And so we often talk about artificial intelligence in this delightfully ahistoric way. So, you know, artificial intelligence as a term was coined back in the 1950s. It's actually linked back to all of those cybernetics conversations because the same people who were talking about cybernetics went on to talk about AI. I think you could say somewhat flippantly that the AI conversation was basically cybernetics stripping out the people in the environment because that was the messy stuff and <laughs> just focusing on the tech. That is to do no one a good credit, so I really wouldn't want to make that a serious argument, but there is a sort of a, a, a way where the AI conversation proceeds in talking about having machines simulate humans but not necessarily about what it means to have the humans still there. One of the things about AI in the 21st century is that, of course, it's – not just being built by governments, it's being built by commercial enterprises. And whereas in the 1950s, much of the conversation was about the research agenda that would be AI, these days we also talk about who's producing it and what they're doing with it. And what is the intent of it, right? You know, is it about collecting data in order to make different kinds of determinations and why would those be? One of the challenges, of course, is you say surveillance and everyone thinks that's bad. Of course, there are surveillance strategies that aren't bad. We surveil water systems and septic systems in order to determine if there are problems so that we can fix them, where surveillance is hyper-necessary. We surveil wildlife populations you know, to determine their healthfulness. But it's certainly the case that some of the data that is being collected at the moment creates enormous challenges. And as a result, we have seen large companies make decisions about what technologies they are using and indeed stop using certain kinds of technologies until they can get their legislative and standards and policy frame, frameworks and settings right. So I would you know, look there to what, for instance, Microsoft did with camera and computer vision and facial recognition technologies and stopping working on it until they could find it in a policy setting that they were comfortable with. I think that's an interesting example of saying, yes, there's a technology, but you can choose not to use it or deploy it if you didn't think you could get to a policy setting that you had comfort with. We also know that some forms of new technologies are being used not just to look at what we're doing, but to look at what we're doing in order to decide what we might want to do next. So, you know, whether that's the lightweight things that sit inside Netflix or inside dating apps, or inside Amazon, which is really about determining who you are and what you like in order to work out what you might like next. So think about that, use, use the word desire, and that's how I would think about mm -hmm. that, right? It's like, how do we help satisfy your desires for things, or people, or stuff? So what about this migration from security to then people sort of add privacy 
into that conversation. Mm-hmm. And I think part of that is because of this, well, we're starting to surveil people to help them with their desires and or help with the traffic flow or whatnot. And now I feel like, and I know there's not standards all over the world when it comes to privacy, though there is a common definition for it, but it, it varies. Feels like now the tech world is moving more to the term trustworthiness. What's after that? And do we just keep kind of evolving these terms? It's important to talk about the difference between probably security, privacy, trust, and risk, at least, and maybe responsibility, all of those being slightly different things, right? And we've bundled them together, which I also think is really interesting. And you're right, it's not just about the are they replacements, but what does it say that we are needing to have that bundle of words to describe a set of phenomena, right? Privacy is a relatively new term. And our notions about what is private and what isn't incredibly fungible and have changed remarkably even over the arc of our lifetimes. And I imagine we'll continue to do so. I mean, information that we would never have discussed in public even 30 years ago is, you know, commonly (laughs) discussed even by politicians, which is quite remarkable. One of the challenges we've had sitting inside the tech sector is that designing for privacy is not designing for a fixed thing. Mm -hmm. It's not like I'm designing for the voltage that comes out of the wall that's relatively standard. It's like, no, actually, how people think about, manage, and engage in privacy practices has changed over time, changes for individuals in the arc of their lifetime, and is different across different platforms. So you've got that kind of interesting dynamic. My suspicion is one of the places where legislation hasn't kept up, because you write this legislation about privacy, but everyone has an idea about certain kinds of data that can't be released or that needs to be have more safeguards on it. In the US, that's particularly true around medical and healthcare data. In Europe, it's a much broader set of data that's covered that way. One of the challenges, of course, is that as humans, we don't just worry about our personal data. We worry about the ways in which that data is used to make judgments about us. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing to say, am I concerned that you might know how old I am or what my education level is or what my ethnic background is or what my religion or national or sexual orientations are? Individual pieces, often called, you know, data attributes, those pieces, you know, are we required to hold them? privately as you know various kinds of organizations and governments as a citizen or a consumer you might be equally concerned about how someone uses that data to make a determination about what music you like or what food you eat or what kinds of clothes you like and about what that says about you and those pieces have been less about privacy per se and I suspect are more about things like our taste you know, there's something in all of that that feels different than privacy. Well, what about this notion that as, let's say, AI or some, you know, compute is when algorithms are starting to like narrow down who you are and kind of predict what you might like, that you may also be limited in access. So all these filters are coming. So now you don't know what you don't know because you're not seeing information that if it knew nothing about you, it would have to provide. One of the things that's very true in American culture and in lots of other cultures too is that we get to grow and be different. We get to change who we are over time and change what we like and find new ways of being in the world. And one of the problems with the way data is often mobilized is that what it does is the choices you are given in any kind of moment in a recommendation engine, just to pick an example, is based on what you've already done. Mm -hmm. So it's always based on the past. And one of the things that happens there is that you can then get locked into who you've been Mm -hmm. and limit your possibility of growing, changing, being something different. Or I think, as you put it, encountering things outside of the stuff that you know you like. And I tend to like to imagine, maybe it's foolish, that some of the most interesting moments I've had in my life was when I encountered something that didn't work the way I thought it should, or when I encountered something I wasn't expecting, or when I stood in front of a piece of art, or I read a book, or went to a movie that made me initially quite grumpy, (laughs) I don't like it at all, or we had to go, oh, because what you're doing is actually having to think through something that sits outside your frame of reference. And I, I worry 
now spend time educating people as well as dealing with governments and industry, that you want to have people have moments where they can encounter things they didn't expect because in those encounters you get to be transformed and that feels like a really important thing. And I, I do worry at a level that our reliance on algorithmic structures that use past data, that what we're doing is locking us into a kind of, well, building the present and the future on a path that, to circle back to an even earlier part of this conversation, I don't think it's fair, just equitable or sustainable. I want to ask you about something that we haven't talked about. It's one of the things that you work on as part of cybernetics, which is the environment. You use the word sustainable and That is kind of an old word, too. And I'm just wondering, you know, some people talk about generative kinds of environmental approaches. And why did you choose sustainable? I'm sitting here (laughs) in Canberra, right? And about 900 kilometers north of me, there is a river that's in flood currently because it is raining here a great deal. (laughs) That river is the Barwon River. And that river flows across the New South Wales Queensland border. And that town is at a point where there's an intersection of rivers and a huge flow through of water when it's raining. It's also a place where there is a set of fish weirs, mm-hmm. stone fish weirs built into that river that help collect and hold fish. Those stone weirs were built by the Aboriginal people that are local to that region. They were built, archaeologists will argue this point, somewhere between forty to 10,000 years ago. That narrows it down. <laughs> It does narrow it down. Either one of those dates, however, makes it one of the oldest technical structures on the planet. And these are deliberate interventions into a water system, right? You have to understand hydrology and lithics and biology in order to make them work. They have been modified and adapted over many years. And they were still being used before the flood started in December. So here is a system somewhere between 10 to 40,000 years in the making and in the keeping a system that involves in sophisticated understanding of a range of technical systems, a sophisticated understanding of the environment and a willingness to adapt and change to the changes in the environment over time, and one that allowed groups of people to gather on the banks of those rivers to make law and knowledge and family. And I look at that and I go, okay, there's a system that has endured and been utilized over a protracted period of time Mm -hmm. and is one that has sustained populations and human endeavor, but it's also one that has been sustainable as in it has been built and rebuilt and built into that place with a notion of how that place worked rather than an idea of how we might, you know, overbuild it. And I tend to think of that as a, well, it's a cybernetic system, obviously, Mm -hmm. although, you know, 10 to 40,000 years ago, I'm fairly certain that no one said, oh, it's cybernetic. They're like, yeah, we need fish. I'm like, okay, we should work it out and do that. But there's something about the idea of a system built to thread those pieces mm-hmm. together and one that was built with an idea that it should last over decades and centuries and that in doing that, that meant that lots of people needed to understand how it worked and needed to understand why it was doing what it was doing and how it was doing that in that place. So it's also about local knowledge it's about knowledge that's transmitted over generations so there's something for me there about the sustainable being an idea that has room in it to think about lots of important ideas so information that is transmitted things that are built into local places rather than imposed from somewhere else and as i sort of think about what it means to imagine that for the 21st century i do it also mindful that i'm in a place that's at the pointy edge Mm -hmm. of the climate change conversation, partly because the science is still being litigated by some parts of the spectrum here in Australia, but also because it is very clear, having had the bushfires before the pandemic, that, you know, we have choices to make here about how we want to live our lives that will require a different conversation. And technology sits inside that in two different ways, right? It sits inside it in the How do we use technology to help us make better decisions about water flows and climate change and about the livability of cities and about how we want to manage ourselves in this place as it changes? But there are also questions we need to reasonably ask about technology itself as a part of that puzzle. So how do we think about the next generation of server farms so that the energy budget they use is less than the one they use now? (laughs) 
because mm -hmm. server farms are quite power intensive. How do we think about building computational objects that require less energy? How do we think about building computational objects that require less of all the other materiality that we know is complicated to acquire and has itself a flow on effect? Mm -hmm. How do we think about the other bit of the puzzle that we don't spend as much time talking about, but about how we recycle mm -hmm. technology when we're done with it, how we limit the negative impacts of having huge piles of no longer useful mobile phones mm -hmm. and all sort of materiality that goes with that, right? So for me, there's this sort of overlay I want to add that isn't just about how do we use technology to ensure we have a pathway forward, but also how do we ensure that that technology is not self, to borrow a very old phrase, part of the problem? <laughs> and how do we think about the whole life cycle of our technical systems as part and parcel of that complexity? Every time we you know, want to build a microprocessor into something, how are we thinking about the end game? Genevieve Bell, it's been both fun and thought-provoking talking with you today about cybernetics, a field that brings together humanity, ecology, and technology. Thanks so much for joining us on the podcast today, Cybersecurity Inside. Never miss an episode of What That Means with Camille by following us here on YouTube. You can also find episodes wherever you get your podcasts. The views and opinions expressed are those of the guests and author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Intel Corporation. Mm -hmm.